And good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, everybody. This is Adam Gordon, and I am here with my cohort. Fred Cohen. Fred Cohen. And we are Oya Security Growth, and we help grow cybersecurity companies. Fred is a luminary in the cybersecurity world. Fred, I hope you're giving off light this morning. Uh, well, at least heat. At least feet, okay. Oh, heat, heat, heat. Heat, heat, heat. Yeah, you're supposed to give off more light than heat, but sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. And I am Adam Gordon, a longtime marketer and corporate storyteller. And um, together we are OSG, and Fred and I do this podcast every Thursday, almost every Thursday, and we talk about the intersection of marketing and cybersecurity and other things that might be interesting to polymaths like us. You know, just the critical thing to understand here is that Ramadan starts. So this is, I, I think tomorrow, tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan. Ramadan. And then there's the next holiday right after it, Dhamma Dhamma Ding Dong. I don't think so. <laughs> I suppose that's not an appropriate joke to be making. No, I think, I think that you should respect all religions and and you know as uh, Jewish people especially we we should be respectful of others because we get disrespected so much but just to be clear the next Jewish holiday I see on the calendar is Yom Hazikaron which and followed by Yom Hazam Hazamout so, <laughs> so I don't think we should be calling people out you know, with their naming of holidays. <laughs> I think well, the Jewish I, calendar has more holidays than any other religion. I think, think that, well, maybe other than the Hindi religion that has like, you know, seven million gods or something. And I think they have, that every god has at least one holiday. I don't, I, I don't think so. But, okay. but, uh, but I know that, you know, so in Judaism, like in Islam, uh, you know, the Sabbath is every week. Right. And, and so that is a Jewish holiday. In fact, that's maybe the most observed and most sacred of Jewish holidays. Yeah. Um, and, and then you add on the, the Yom whatevers and the, the Owl whatevers and everything else. And you end up, I think, probably at least a third of the days are holidays. And that doesn't include weekends if you live in the West. So <clears throat> by the time we're done, I think 50 to 60 percent of all the days you could take off if you spend the holiday. <laughs> and if you're in a multi-religious family, if you pick the right religions, you can probably just take every day off. Day off. Right. Which is what a lot of people are apparently doing today. <laughs> oh, but that's a COVID thing. Okay, one way or the other. All right. So I know you had a subject to discuss today, and we've already been <laughs> the first so many minutes. <laughs> well, it's always fun. Um, so this is where I wanted to start today, actually, with what else but COVID. Um, so talk and about a lousy piece of graphics. You don't like this graphic. Well, my, my point is, from a standpoint of evaluating graphics, this display has all sorts of problems. What do you think those problems are? Well, the first thing is it's white on black, which might be because you invert things, but I don't think so. It's white uh -huh. on black and it makes it hard to read. Mm -hmm. and, and especially for people that are older or people that have you know, other limitations in their eyesight and it's relatively low contrast. And then another important thing about these whole classes of diagrams is these, the big circle indicates more cases, but it also then expands, extends over a larger area and therefore is, is inaccurate and imprecise. So, so it, it's really you know, not uh, clearly depicting the actual case. Ah, so what would your preference be? Well, so generally I want high contrast. Right. right? Look at all those low contrast lines. So high contrast is important. Another important thing is that when you're showing things in locations, you properly characterize the location. So, so graphically, you want to cover the area that the statistic actually covers. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, how do you express volume? And you can typically do that by brightness or different colors, right? So you have a spectrum of colors and you increase the brightness. You move to, for a bad thing, you move towards red. For a good mm -hmm. thing, you move towards green, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and you can go through various shadings along the way. So, so that's sort of the way you should, I think, do it. And then look at the color scheme on the left, confirm cases with the red numbers on the left. And by the way, left justified, right? So if they're multi-digit numbers and it looks like they're fixed width fonts, they should be right justified in the numbers. 
so that they line up so you can tell bigger from lower. And then, uh, then the other one, the, the names of Iran and Turkey are skewed off. If you had the numbers right justified and the names left justified, it would all line up. Okay. Nice. So okay. Now, now that one's sorted. And I've looked at a variety of these things uh, and, and most of them have some sorting. And the sort here is by confirmed cases, whatever that means. But you can't get a sort typically by deaths. Now, what they have here is a, a death sort as well. Mm -hmm. But but you know what what you'd really like is is something where you can you know for example look at at the countries sorted. So so you have three lists, two lists of countries, right? Mm -hmm. One with deaths, one with cases. They're different sizes and shapes in different parts of the screen, mm -hmm. right? With different color schemes. And by the way, deaths are in white and confirmed cases are in red. <laughs> Usually red would be dead and, and, <laughs> you know. and, and but recovers are green. Well, and that's a good thing. That's a okay. good thing. Yeah. You know, but, but so, so, and then there's no, so normally what you want to be able to do is understand how they set next to each other. Right. Right. You'd want deaths next to recovered and the ratio of recovery to deaths not one or the other. Mm -hmm. And then you'd want to be able to sort by that ratio to see, for example, how good countries are doing in terms of the actual cases of come to resolution. Mm -hmm. There's another very important thing about COVID that's been increasingly understood recently. And that is that the damages are not just death. The people that recover from it have a variety of problems ranging from um, mental damage to lung damage so there's a lot of long-term expensive health implications and life implications for these people. Oh, I hadn't heard about this. Yeah, so, so, so this is turning out to be perhaps financially more damaging than, than the, you know, the, the mortalities themselves. Um, so so at, in any case, you see examples, you know, and, and uh, obviously a little bit US centric, you know, mm -hmm. total US cases, US tested, Mm -hmm. But again, the inability to put things in comparison and then the, you know, confirmed cases down below, right? Mm -hmm. Does that allow you the same sets of, of, so if they have information on by country, by state, by county, by whatever, then you should be able to see the plots in that manner, right? So I should be able to see Germany, whatever country I pick, whatever state I pick, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and see them plotted against each other for comparison purposes, purposes and see the time sequence. Because what's really actually important here is that time sequencing. <coughs> that is where you are relative to each other. Right. right. So kind of more this graph on the bottom right here, you'd like to see more countries displayed against that. Well, it gives you confirmed logarithmic and daily, but it doesn't, for example, you know, give you by different things. Right or allow you to compare. Yeah, and then look at the different kinds of graphs, right? Right. So the logarithmic, you know, but look at daily cases, it's in a different method of graphing. Entire, well, yeah, you couldn't do that. Well, yeah. you could do that logarithmically, but it would look very strange. Well, the point is that forget about logarithmic or not, it's that this is a, a, a bar chart, right? A vertical yeah. bar chart, and the other ones are line charts. Right. Right, now you look at the line charts, they have these big dots. And, and the big dots are the data, but they don't have to be that big. And, and so there's a lot of sort of uncertainty mm. in where a number is when you look at it. And then, of course, the scales on the left and the bottom are barely bright enough to see, right? Okay. They don't have any horizontal lines, which would be quite useful in this case in understanding when it crossed this number or that number or Actually, especially in do. comparing one they to do. the other when you have multiples up there. They do, Fred. You just can't see them. Oh, is that right there, there? Yeah. Oh, well, I certainly cannot see them. Okay, yeah. so they're so dim you can't see them. That's yep. bad. Yeah, I, I have that problem a lot too. As we get older, that seems to be a problem is that yeah. people think that low contrast stuff looks fine. And if you're 20, sure. But if you're 60, not so much. Well, if you're looking on it in a different screen at a different resolution. Yeah. Right? And, in fact, and so I'm looking at it over a Zoom session and the combination of the resolution of your system and the resolution of my screen, my screen has fantastic resolution, right? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like an 8K, you know, 
whatever, but mm -hmm. you're only transmitting it whatever you're transmitting it. Right. So, and uh, by the way, Zoom is having problems with HD. So more than three people on an HD call has pro they've had been having problems. So you need to move it down to SD. Interesting. So the the actually this brings us to a different topic than what I wanted to talk about. But one of the things I've been thinking a lot about recently is about the um, the flexibility of interfaces. And I'm thinking that um, maybe the days of fixed interfaces may be reaching their limit. And so talk about, you know, the well, difference, sure for instance, true. between how you like to see things on a screen and how I like to see things on a screen. The UI should be able to accommodate mm -hmm. that so you can see what you want and I can see what I want. Well, maybe sort of. There's a little bit more complexity here. Mm -hmm. And that is, remember, if I'm presenting something to you, I may wish to control what you see. Yes. So, so, but, but other than that, but, but let me show you an example of that. And, and before you hand the screen over, I want to just do a couple of things to, um, to make it so we don't provide any information that we should not. And in the meantime, here's a lovely picture because I'm trying to uh, just put some lovely pictures up when we do these for everybody to feel good these days. I think this is a wonderful photo. It's not a, an actual photo, is it? Or, oh, it is. It is, yes. Oh, that is pretty slick. Yeah. So that's you're down in a valley of some sort, and this is the waterfall. Ah, very nice. Yeah. I, the, I, right saw one, I saw one a few weeks ago that was a really wonderful one. It was taken in Yosemite Valley valley um, from Yosemite Falls and it was a moon rainbow. The moon was so bright against Yosemite Falls that night that it actually made a rainbow and somebody actually got a picture of it. I'm trying to find it again. So if anybody out there has it, send it to me, please. <laughs> but it was a beautiful shot and I just, one of those things that I saw go by on the internet and now I can't find where it was again. All right, so now I'm gonna take over the screen for a minute. Okay. And, and show you, so there's, there's a lot of difficulty in trying to do that flexible thing you're talking about. So this is an example of a metrics program that I have, and, and you can see whatever the, the stack bar chart, all, all the information on the left is, we don't want to know, let you know the names of the company, so they're all made confidential and so forth. And, and so this is an example where it's ordered by the uh, first statistic. Mm -hmm. Okay, and on the right hand is valuation, but we can instead um, order it by the second statistic that it's taking. Mm -hmm. It changes the ordering, and we but we could also um, so we so we can turn off the valuation and get that statistic. Right, so so now it's in terms of percentages instead of of dollar values, right? And and there's all sorts of things you can do by changing the way this works. There's a in this case it has different weightings. Mm -hmm. um, we'll sort by valuation here, and you get it sorted. You know, much different. Okay, these companies have more or less of whatever these things are. Right. But by valuations, it looks like you know this guy down here should be in better shape, you know, should be more valuable than the one over here, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, and, and there are various reasons that different people want to look at these pictures in different ways. But so the flexibility of being able to, you know, sort by different things and select different things to show and, you know, turn off, you know, weightings or not weightings and so forth. And then of course, you know, do things like, um, show me the CSV file for this. Mm -hmm. Right. So now I can, you know, download the CSV mm -hmm. or, um, you know, turn off the bar chart. Right. Mm -hmm. Or turn on the help. <laughs> Always a good thing. Yeah. So my point here is not, you know, not about whatever this program is. It's about, you know, you know, what same thing you're going to select out things that meet this string and you're going to select in different fields. Right? Yeah. Yep. And, and you're going to change it from blue to red, right? And you're going to change the font size. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, that was. <laughs> right. And so, you know, this is one of your classic interfaces, Fred, and this starts approaching the kind of control that, that I'm thinking about in terms of what should a UI be able to do. <clears throat> and um, I guess part of it depends on what you're doing. You know, are you browsing the web? Are you looking for something for specific? Right. So, w which fundamentally comes down to what we used to call ergonomics, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And 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 I'm going to stop sharing now, and you can take the screen back over. Okay. So. But but you know, ergonomics are not just the, the physical, but also then the, the informational aspects of it. And so a lot of what, you know, happens in these waterfall type designs, which is something people tend to be opposed to these days, right? They don't like the waterfall. They need the more, more of the rapid development. Right. Rapid development right. And, and of course, so the, the, the problem um, is that, Without the waterfall approach, you typically do not go through the exercise of making determinations about what interface you want and why you want it and who the user is and how they're served and so forth. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And then in the development process, so you, you end up in this rapid development process where you get something sort of functional and then somebody says, how about this? How about that? Right. And then the code is not well thought out. So the, the, when you try to then change the code to do something else, it becomes much, much trickier and you end up having to rewrite and change the way things work, depending on the methodology you used. And there's performance issues and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. so, so all of these things trade back and forth, right? So I used to use the Google graphics for that. And, and in another one of my programs, um, uh, I, I uh, allow you to pick which graphical, you know, so they have 20 or so different ways of depicting data and graphics. So I, and the other one you can pick, you know, do you want the dot chart or the line chart and do you want, yeah. you know, and so forth. And you can pick whatever you want and, and mess around with it. But in truth, there are certain implementations of that, which to me seem just ridiculous and useless. And, and but the other thing is, it takes a lot longer. So you saw, I'm in a Zoom session with you, and I was flipping between, you know, different depictions of this data mm -hmm. and they were popping up, you know, in a second or less. Yeah. Yeah. When I had the Google chart doing the same depiction, uh -huh. it took several seconds when you did mm -hmm. that on the Zoom section. Mm -hmm. So then there's the performance issues. So, so, you know, so all of these things interact with each other. And, and we were just talking about another flaw in Zoom where there's some race condition when, when you uh, say you're going to disconnect somebody, kick them out of the meeting, and they, they leave before you finish the kick out, it crashes it. Right? So all of these sorts of bugs and, and inconsistencies and so forth, they're really hard to get rid of them all. Yeah. And, and so now when you're trying to create more flexibility, everything can show up in a different way, debugging it. You know, anytime you make a code change, you've got to go check everything out. I'm, I'm running simultaneously the test and the execution version on the system. And I have a change control set up in place on this system so that I can run the test data and, and you know, change, make a change and test it in all the different modes mm. and, and, and then put it into the real system. And then invariably, you know, once a month or so, something in the real system stops working because somehow I managed to not test it. There's some difference between the live and the test version. And you end up in an emergency repair because of all the flexibility. Yes. You know, because you yeah. keep trying to add, you know, creeping featureism is what we used to. Right. Call. Right. So there's the, you know, simplicity is the enemy of security, getting back to the security topic. <laughs> Sorry, complexity is the enemy of security. Simplicity, it, it's a, a fundamental principle. It should be as simple as possible and, and no simpler. And, and no simpler, right. Right. I was okay. reading something about that the other day about uh, a story about somebody who took down a fence because obviously the fence had no use whatsoever. And then a few months later, they found out that the fence did have some use. And in fact, there was a herd of cattle that would roam across their land and eat everything if the fence wasn't there. And so the discussion was about how to analyze a system um, 
and not change things so that they break, you found that you have broken something unknowingly. And the ways to think about that so that that kind of thing doesn't happen. And the ultimate conclusion was you have to really deeply understand the system before you can make a change without unintended consequences. So also interesting. So the unintended consequences um, happen all the time, but um, there are consequences that should not be unknown because right. we've seen them before versus right. the consequences which are, you know, more of the so-called, you know, black swan phenomenon, right? Right. And people claim a lot of things are black swans that are not, and that's one of the reasons, especially in security, which has a very long history. Many people <laughs> don't bother to read the history and repeat the same mistakes, but it's not just obviously in security. It's also obviously in all sorts of other areas, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and a good example would be in oh, um, global pandemics. <laughs> <laughs> just happened to pick one, pick a yeah, subject. Just randomly out of my head. So, so it, you know, I, my article for next month on all.net, which mm -hmm. you can't see yet because it's not on all.net yet. Um, in fact, I'm going to give you a, a preview of it here. I'll, I'll take the screen show, screen share, and, and if you don't mind. It's your Zoom session. You get to do what you want. You're in control of the vertical. You're in control of the horizontal. I just said the same thing to my wife earlier today when she was in control of the TV. I said. <laughs> now, 10 points if you know the reference. Well, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, some to some people. Well, think science fiction series, 1960s, 1970s. There was the Twilight Zone. That, well, that's what I had somebody guess the other day. But that's not where it comes from. No. But it was uh, the right genre, so he got seven and a half points for that. Well, you know, but that's close doesn't count. Right? <laughs> no, it was, it was the Outer Limits. Yes. And there was a one Outer Limits episode that was in two parts. That when I was younger, I saw the first part, and I really wanted to see the second part. And it wasn't there the next week. And I looked and I looked and I couldn't find it. And I still haven't seen it. So I'm hoping that I will not die before I see the closing. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you could find that out there somewhere now. Well, I, I have the whole set of DVDs, but you know how long it takes to go through them. Okay. Yes. So what I'm showing you now is there's a hole in my bucket. You know this. Song. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there's all, you know, dear Liza, dear Liza, there's a hole in my bucket. Dear Liza, a hole. And then I just related to, as it turns out, the U.S. didn't have enough COVID-19 test kits or whatever. So fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry, dear Henry. So fix it, dear Henry, dear Henry. So fix it. Uh, so why didn't we have more of them? With what shall I fix it? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Uh, they were sold out. But with straw. All right, so why didn't we make more of them? But the straw is too long because we didn't have enough swabs to make them. By the way, we still don't have enough swabs. Right? <laughs> So you go down through this scenario, and at the end, it, it turns out, you know, why don't we produce more cotton in the U.S., you know, to fix the problem? Because everybody is sick <laughs> because it's going in there. <laughs> so, so solving these interdependency problems, I'm going to stop. I don't want to ruin the rest of the article, but um, so you, you can share your screen back. But, but so the, the point here is that there are, technical methods to deal with this, but the, it's not feasible for a human being to see all of these things, you know, in their mind. You, you need, you know, deep analytics, right? You need interdependency analysis that's recursive. And, and if you don't understand what you're dependent on and take that into account, you make a lot of bad mistakes mm -hmm. and they're very harmful. And in politics, of course, this is sort of fundamental, right? So you start a trade war with China, and then you say mean things about them. And now, just recently, the price of, of uh, the masks, um, K95 masks, has gone up by a dollar at wholesale from China. Mm -hmm. That's, and it was, you know, they were running like, you know, 275 or something like that. And yeah, that's a huge market. jump. Yeah, they're now a dollar. It's like a 30% increase, whatever, in price. Now, there are suppliers in India that make them as well, so the Indian price is staying lower, but, but the Chinese suppliers just upped their price. They yeah. basically said, hey, you know, kiss my whatever, 
<laughs> well, you know, it's, you, 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 know you, you want to insult us about being the source of the virus and not telling you and not blah, blah, blah. Good. We'll pay us another dollar for each of the hundred million masks <laughs> you need in the next week. It's Adam Smith's invisible hand, supply and demand working right there in front of us. It's not invisible. It's a quite visible hand and it's in working case, in front of us because we do things that induce it. Yes. And yes. it's not something that would be, oh, I could never have figured that. Who could have ever known that when you insult the people in China <laughs> who are supplying you with the one thing you need in order to have your economy succeed and you, and you start a trade war with them, who could have ever imagined they would do something like this? Well, <laughs> anybody with, with no imagination at all could have figured this out. <laughs> all right, we're getting way too close to politics now, so. No, and, no, it's not about politics. It's about dependencies. Yes, okay. It was getting close to politics, but it is about dependencies, you're right. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, becoming a part of a global community the way we did and then trying to pull out of that causes all of these weird things to happen because suddenly you have dependencies that you're just ignoring. Dependencies because you're part of this global community of trading and everything else that we did at when we were a more active part of the global community. Well, so there's a difference between that really obvious dependency that I just pointed out. Mm -hmm. um, like, okay, you know, and, and, and it's the same with lots of things, right? So if I'm going to run computers, I'm going to need electrical power. Okay, pretty obvious. Okay, whether I get it from solar or what. Mm -hmm. It's when you go down the supply chain and you say, you know, what's this computer made of? Right, well, it has these 47 or 470 or however many parts, right? Well, where do those parts come from? Well, they're manufactured by here and here and here. Is there a redundant supply for these parts? Uh, no, so you can't replace them. You can only get them one place. Okay, well, what for this part there is and for that part there's not. Okay, so so now how, for the part that, that's redundant, you know, tell me about the supply chain of those three redundant suppliers. Well, it turns out 14 steps back in the supply chain, they all come from the same place. <laughs> so it wasn't in fact redundancy. And that's what happened when there was a, a, a fire at a plant that made memory chips in Taiwan a couple of years ago, right? That was in fact the source for all of the memory. That, well, not all of the memory, no, but most all, of the memory. all of that class of memory. Right, okay. Um, um, everywhere, right? And so all the different companies ended up, you know, that was where it all came from is that, that one place. So <clears throat> understanding the supply chain, if you know enough about that specific supply chain, that's one thing. But now suppose I'm on a boat on the ocean and the engine breaks, right? And I'm, I'm saying, oh my God, what's wrong with the engine? You know, it's not a spark plug. Oh, it's this, this automated control component that's part of the, the regulator in here somewhere, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of electronics. Okay, well, gee, I don't have a spare engine. I'm already using the other one. <laughs> <laughs> so what do I do now? Well, if you had this entire supply chain understood, you could say, well, is there a replacement part? Is there a way to cause this same function to happen or to turn off that function? And now you say, oh, wait. So on my ship, you know, besides all these, you know, engine things, you know, it turns out I, I also have a GPS control system that's an ancillary control system that handles the, uh, the anchors. And it turns okay. out that one of those parts is in one of those anchor control systems. <laughs> so I can go open up the anchor control system, get a, a replacement part, minor reprogram it. How do I reprogram it? Go back into the, the supply chain and figure out, oh, here's the instruction differences. You change the instructions, put it in, and now I have a working engine again. Yay. So now, you know, Apollo 13, right? Where they ended up making a filter out of whatever was on hand so they right. could survive. And, you know, they didn't fit the same way. Okay, so the same sort of analysis, if you can automate that analysis and do it in a timely fashion, you know, well, I don't have this swab, what can I do? Well, gee, we have these shorter swabs and it turns out the cotton on the end is different. Okay, well, but we have a cotton factor. So by understanding that and analyzing that supply chain automatically, you can potentially solve these problems. And then the other thing is, of course, avoid getting into them in the first place. 
<laughs> yes. Uh, predictive analytics, that's tough. As Yogi Berra once said, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Yeah, well, it's not that easy even to do prediction about the past. Yes, it's true. Well, you understand they're, they're now doing that, right? So it turns out February 6th is the first known case of COVID-19 in the United States, and that was in California. It killed a woman, and they found this by autopsy. It killed a woman who had no foreign travel and no right. apparent contact. So it was already in and 57 and February healthy. 6th. Yeah, and she was so, 57 and healthy. That's correct. Yeah. Right. So, so now all of a sudden they're trying to re-figure out predictively, starting at that new past event, try and predict forward from there to figure out how many people are actually infected today because mm -hmm. we don't have a testing regimen. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and, and, and you don't know. I mean, maybe the case, the first case in China was somebody traveling from Burma you know, oh. who got infected last October by somebody in Africa. Well, the Chinese have said for months now that it was actually caused by an American uh, athletic, uh, an arm, a military athletic group that went over yeah. there. Yeah, That's what they've it. been saying. Yeah, so, so the, the point about the difference between propaganda and science is a very important one. It is. <laughs> right? So people make all sorts of BS claims. Yes. Right? Investigating those claims. And by the way, this has to do with buying and selling too, right? So when you, when you make a BS claim, when you offer from something for sale and you have a sophisticated customer, they're going to call BS on it and they're going to look it up. And if it turns out that it's BS, you've lost their trust forever. Uh, Personally, as the salesperson, the company as a company, and by the way, I'm likely to blast it out on the internet and I only have about 10 or 15,000 followers. So <laughs> all of them in computer security, most of them are almost, most of them now in computer security, a lot of them are startups um, in other fields. And, and most of those people are fairly high up in the computer security world. So there is a tendency for that to really come back and smack you, so don't do it. <laughs> Right. Now we've run long again and never gotten to whatever topic you had. <laughs> well, we've gone into some interesting ones and I've got a great topic for next week already. So uh, with that, we're going to sign off. Thank you folks for listening. We are Fred Cohen and Adam Gordon and we are Oya Security Growth, where we help grow cybersecurity companies. Everybody be safe, have fun and be safe.